You're listening to the Mother to Baby Podcast, medications and more during pregnancy and breastfeeding. Ask the experts with your host, genetic counselor and mama four, Chris Stallman. This episode contains evidence-based information that's current as of the day recorded and may change as more data becomes available. To get the very latest information about this topic or other topics in pregnancy and breastfeeding, please contact a mother-to-baby specialist at 866-626-6847, by text at 855-999-3525, or through our website at mothertobaby.org. Welcome to another episode of the Mother to Baby podcast. My name is Chris Stallman, and I'm a mom of four, a genetic counselor, and a teratogen information specialist. So what that means is I give information to people, so patients, family members, healthcare providers, about exposures that can happen before pregnancy, during pregnancy, while breastfeeding, and in cases of adoption. And an exposure can be anything. So it could be a medication that you're taking. It could be hair dye. It could be a virus or anything in between. And today we are going to be talking about a very specific virus and birth defects awareness month. So today our topic is going to be CMV. And that's the name of a virus called cytomegalovirus. And we have a very special guest to give us some more information. Our guest today is here to talk with us also about Birth Defects Awareness Month. We have Amanda Devereaux. Amanda graduated with her bachelor's degree in nursing in 2007. She has worked in public health for 14 years, most recently focusing on maternal child health. Currently, Amanda works as the program director for the National CMV Foundation, and she became passionate about eliminating congenital CMV when her daughter was born affected by the virus in 2015. Amanda, thank you so much for being here, and welcome to the show. Thanks for having me. Happy to be here. While we think about birth defects all year round, we pay special attention in the month of January. So Amanda, can you tell us what is the goal of Birth Defects Awareness Month? The goal of Birth Defects Awareness Month is, is really just to raise the awareness of birth defects among the general public and healthcare providers, parents, families, everybody, and also really to raise awareness of the impact that birth defects have on people living with the conditions or uh, you know, their families and the community in general. So you're representing the National CMV Foundation. Can you tell us what is CMV and how does it relate to birth defects? Yeah, so CMV is a very common virus. Anybody can catch it at any time. And it's very common among the general population. Most people have had it by the time that they're 40. A lot of times people have it and they, they have no idea. They might have very mild symptoms or maybe no symptoms at all, or maybe just cold flu-like symptoms and they would never get tested for CMV because it resolves on its own pretty quickly. However, sometimes a person who's pregnant will catch CMV during the pregnancy. And in that case, the virus can cross the placenta and infect the baby. So the baby actually catches CMV before birth. And when that happens, depending upon a lot of different factors, it can cause birth defects. And so when a baby is infected with CMV, when they catch CMV before birth, that is called congenital CMV. It means that they're born with it. And some babies who are born with congenital CMV do great. They, they are perfectly typical throughout their childhood and throughout their life. And some babies who are born with CMV may have some birth defects or they may develop some health conditions later on in the first few months or few years of their life. So that's kind of CMV in a nutshell. How did you get involved with Birth Defects Awareness Month and the CMV Foundation? 
Sure. So I think I'll start with how I got involved with the CMB Foundation because that really happened first. So my daughter was in, I caught CMB for the first time when I was pregnant with my second baby. And I caught it during the first part of my pregnancy. And so my baby was infected with CMV early in the pregnancy, and it really affected the way that her body, and particularly her brain, developed during the pregnancy. So she was born with a birth defect. Um, it's called polymicrogyria. It is um, the way that her brain looks, the way that her brain formed. It did not form the way it typically does. And so she has what we might call a brain malformation. And so that is her birth defect. Well, one of the things that CMV caused for her was this birth defect of her brain. And so I got involved with the National CMV Foundation first, just as a volunteer trying to raise awareness of CMV. And then I started working for the foundation in 2020 as the program director. So I, I do a lot of different <coughs> things for the foundation. Um, but our big goal at National CMV is to prevent um, pregnancy loss, childhood death, and disability due to CMV. Through my work with the foundation, we are always looking for ways to get involved with other partners and awareness months and things like that where we can really spread the message about CMV. And so Birth Defects Awareness Month was one of the things that we really thought this is a perfect opportunity for people to learn about CMV. Um, how it can be, how, how the risk can be reduced, but also how families are impacted by it, how children are impacted by it when they are born with CMV. What, what can be done? What support do they need? That type of thing. So when I started with the foundation, this was one of my goals was to get involved with Birth Defects Awareness Month. It's really exciting when you have groups that can give you that support. Um, I do not have any children with CMV. Like you said, I probably had CMV. I think a lot of people have, if not most people. Um, but I think that sometimes there's a gap between the resources that families need after something like this. Of course, you know, you, you want to take care of your child. You're doing the very best that you can. You want to take care of yourself and your family. And then what about those extra supports? What about those things that you don't think of? And I find so often, at least for me, I don't know what I don't know. And it's like, well, how do I know if I have everything I need or if I'm in tune? So it's always really good to hear that there's a foundation that can give that type of support. What kind of support does the CMV Foundation give, for example? Well, you know, one of the things we try to do is, um, first of all, reduce the risk of CMV. So, so we're always working on educational um, materials programs. There's vaccine development. There's a lot of exciting work on the prevention end of things. But then we're also really focused on, too, what are the supports that families need when they get this diagnosis, if they get this diagnosis. Um, another, an entire other area of focus is how do we identify these kids early mm -hmm. so that they can work that they need. So screening is, is another area where we focus. But then also, then there's the next piece. You get the diagnosis, now what? So there are some, you know, some roadmaps for families, um, for providers, for what children born with CMV might need access to, and so we provide those. I think another big thing is, in some ways, um, CMV is unique because there are some things about it that maybe um, families with this diagnosis might be dealing with that families with another diagnosis might not. You know, all everything's a little bit different. There are some common threads, and I think that general disability support, general birth defect support is certainly helpful for families who are born with, who have a child born with congenital CMV, but then I also think that there are some unique things. So we do try to pair families if they want to connect with another CMV family, a family who's been impacted. We try to make those connections for people. So we're always willing to do that. We have myself, a staff member who, who has a child with CMV, and then we do maintain a database, a list of families in different states who are willing to talk to another family and really provide that one-on-one -on -one connection that these families might be looking for. That's awesome. That's awesome. There's a lot to be said for the internet. Um, but I think one of the best things about it is the ability for people to connect who have any type of commonality and they may not have someone in their neighborhood who understands, but yet, you know, we can connect online, which is really cool. Yeah. Yeah. And there are some really amazing, um, you know, 
CMV groups out there on the internet that people can find. And if those are helpful for people, those are great. We we don't personally run any of those, mm -hmm. but they're out there and people are, you know, people find a lot of support that way. And and maybe some people don't find those helpful and they want, you know, they want to really talk to someone on the phone or connect with someone another way. And we're glad to try to support those as well. And I appreciate that too, because that's the other thing that you don't hear. So I do, one of my children does have special needs. And one of the things that I have not gotten through the messaging is it's okay that your journey is different. Everyone's going to look a little different. You know, there are so many supports and so many great things out there, but that's not always what's right for everybody. And I'm so glad that you acknowledge that because it is okay that your journey looks, it doesn't mean you're doing any more or less than anyone else. It just means that your journey looks a little bit different. Yeah, everybody's going to find the certain things supportive, certain things maybe don't work for somebody. And, and so it's maybe yep. just about different things and figuring out what's helpful for you when you're going through this journey. And maybe one person's perspective isn't very helpful for you, but you talk to somebody else and you're like, yes, that I connect with that. And so I do think it's a little bit of trial and error because everybody's perspectives are different. So while we're thinking about families, what is the message you'd like to send to families who are affected by CMV? Well, I think mainly just you're not alone. And I, I, you're not alone. This, this is actually a really common thing. It didn't used to be diagnosed as much. It's getting diagnosed more and more now. So we're going to have a bigger community. I think every year this community is going to be growing. So I think that that's a big mes message is that you're not alone. Um, there are support supports out there. There are resources. We're happy to connect to people. Um, the other thing, I, I this is just a big piece of, of advice tip. People can take it or leave it. But I think the the biggest thing for me is to not think too long term. Take things really slow. Like, I mean, at the beginning, I was really trying to focus on a week at a time. What can I do for my child this week? Because if I started thinking what's my child's life going to look like five years from now, 10 years from now, 20 years from now, that's when I started feeling really, really overwhelmed. And so it really helped me to narrow that down to what do I need to do for her this week? What do I do need to do for her this month? It's hard to live with that unknown. And you don't really know what a child with CMV, what their exact life course is going to look like. It's different for each one. And so that's, that's difficult to sit with, but you'll get there with practice and you'll get better at just looking at the short term. That's my advice, I guess. <laughs> so I wonder if you've been just sort of clanking around in my head these last few days, because <laughs> um, I, I think I really needed to hear that. And I think oh, that, okay. I, I it, it, you know, and obviously that's very selfish and very self-involved, but I do think that a lot of people m might benefit from being reminded of, take it in the moment if you can, you know, and the other thing that I, I love, and I have people who are so kind and, and remind us of this every day is you're doing the best you can. Yeah. And yeah. you're doing a you, good job. Yes, you are. And you have to do what works for your family. There are people out there who are, I mean, for example, this is just one example. They're doing way more therapy than we're doing. Well, we have gotten to a point in our family where this is what works for us. This is the most we can do right now. Keeping in mind all these different factors, how much time we have, our other kids, how much my child enjoys or doesn't enjoy going to therapy, how much benefit we're getting, you know, the cost. I mean, there's all these different factors. So really not comparing yourself to what other people are doing and really focusing on what works for your family. That's, I think, really important. And I don't think it can be said enough um, when you have multiple people in a situation, like you said, you know, you have you and your child, certainly, and everybody is different and you might have other family members involved and you might not. And, you know, just being gentle with yourself and, and with how it all is going. So I do appreciate that. What is your hope for the future of, of research and education for CMV? Oh man, I've got a I've got a wish list. I've got a big wish list here. <laughs> That's awesome. Um, <laughs> That's good. Well, my number one goal is we don't have to worry about this anymore. And yeah. it, what I think would be the best is if we were able to really eliminate this 
the point of, like congenital rubella. Mm-hmm. People don't really care about congenital rubella anymore, and that's because we're vaccinating for rubella w- when kids are little. So, you know, you don't really think about that, but them getting that vaccine when they're little is preventing them from giving their children congenital rubella syndrome when they have them, right. you know, all decades later. So that's where I think the ultimate long, long-term future of, of CMV is. I think we're still quite a ways away from, from that, um, although there are some clinical trials in the works right now. Um, in the short term, I, we need better screening during screening and treatment options during pregnancy. You know, if people do get identified during pregnancy, there's really limited things that we can do. We need something we can give people during pregnancy. We also need better treatments and intervention for the children when they're born with CMV and they are identified. What what works for them? What helps them, um, you know, learn and grow as, as best as they can? And so I think we need we need better better treatments and interventions from pregnancy all the way through after these children are born. I also think just in the short term, we need to do a better job of educating people about the steps that they can take to reduce their risk during pregnancy. I tell you, that's that's something that's very hard for our families to deal with and they don't understand. And there's a lot of frustration among families who have this diagnosis that no one told them about this. Yeah. I feel like even, you know, they go back to their doctor afterwards and they say, why didn't you tell me that there were some steps I could take to reduce my risk, not eliminate my risk, but but to reduce the risk. And they feel very frustrated that they were robbed, in a sense, of the opportunity to try to reduce the risk. So that's another thing I would like to see change. I can't imagine the frustration that would come with that when it it's something you know that again and i'm so glad that you mentioned that too there's no such thing as zero risk right it right you can live in a bubble for nine months right like we tell people or i tell people on the phones at least you know and and there's always going to be a chance but it, it's the re- the reduction the yeah. lowering of the risk can you give us some examples what are some ways people can lower their risk of getting cmv in pregnancy yeah, so it's actually simple things. It's what we call them hygienic precautions or ways to avoid germs because it's thought that the most common way that people who are pregnant are catching this is from young children, toddlers, um, and infants that they're caring for in their own homes or maybe that they're caring for at work, especially if they work in a daycare center. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So what we need to do is we need to try to reduce our contact with the urine and saliva of young children. So how are we gonna do that? Well, we're gonna wash our hands really well after we feed children, after we change their diapers, so that that soap is going to kill that that virus. So that's one way. Um, We're not going to share cups or spoons or utensils or food with young children. This is something I was guilty of my entire pregnancy and it would have been a a pretty easy fix um, because I had no idea when my toddler didn't finish his breakfast and I didn't want to waste it. I thought, oh, I'm not going to throw that perfectly good food away. I'll just I'll just eat the rest of that muffin because I don't want to waste food. I had no clue that that was increasing my risk of, of catching CMV. Mm-hmm. And that's, that's an easy one. So don't share their cup. Don't share their spoon. Don't clean a pacifier in your mouth that's been in a, in a toddler or a baby's mouth. Oh, good one. Those are those are some of the big things. Also, kissing children, that's another one, too. You know, it, I will say this does take a little bit of a shift, but when that toddler climbs up onto you and they want to give you a big, wet, drooly kiss on the lips when you're pregnant, yeah. you know, redirecting that a little bit and saying, oh, I'm going to give you a big kiss on the forehead instead of a kiss on the lips because that saliva goes right into your mouth then, and that's one of the most um, common body fluids that CMV spreads in. And just to kind of give people perspective here, um, this is actually one of the more common ways that, you know, that birth defects happen in terms of, you know, we're avoiding kitty litter and we're avoiding sushi and we're avoiding these other things, which we should do. Um, But CMV is much more common than all those things. Um, You know, it happens in about one in 200 pregnancies, which again, doesn't sound like a lot, a half a percent. But when you apply that to all the babies born yeah. in the United States, it's thousands of birth defects every year. So it's 
it's a lot. And so even if we could improve it a little bit, it would save a lot of a lot of babies being born with birth defects. Such a good reminder because there's lots of other things too that we're spreading in the exact same way. And so yeah, it 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 there is a disconnect right? Because I remember them telling me all the time, you know, don't kiss your kids hands, you know, because I got littles and you know, they're cute. And I love them. And we all do, you know, and yeah, I've, gosh, I I've eaten more half eaten toddler plates than I can than I than I should admit. <laughs> yeah. Actually, but yeah, it, it it makes so much sense. That's exact. And yeah, when I end up with their cold a few days later, it absolutely makes sense. Yeah. And of course, some of it's unavoidable, and we don't want yeah. anyone to stress their entire pregnancy. That's not our message at all. Our message is really to just try to limit it as much as you can, try to reduce the risk. We don't want people to be stressing. We just want them to, to take the knowledge. We think that people really deserve to have the information, and then they can do with it what they want. And so if you have access to this information, if you choose to make these small steps to hopefully reduce your risk, you can do that. That's the key. Your mm -hmm. informed choice. Yep. You, yep. we all know people can make choices. People do it all the time, but having the information going forward is a little bit different than not knowing that it's there. You know, and as we think about continuing to get the word out, not just in January for Birth Defects Awareness Month, but all year round through all of our channels, what is, the way that we can share these tips, like is there a hashtag that we should be using and looking for to get the word out about CMV? Yeah, well, for Birth Defects Awareness Month in general, um, there will be a hashtag this year, um, every, hashtag every journey matters. So definitely look for that hashtag um, during January and throughout the year. And then I would say for CMV, we always try and use the hashtag stop CMV. So um, if you, if you follow that hashtag, you'll see a lot of our content too. Um, but yeah, we're always trying to spread the word that way. Awesome. How is your daughter? So my daughter is great. Um, she's, she's eight years old now. She's completely amazing. She's, I mean, in a lot of ways, she's just like any other kid. Mm -hmm. You know, we, we do the same things for her that we do for our, our other child. We parent him exactly the way he is. And we parent her exactly the way she is. And so in a lot of ways, it's not really different. We're just meeting our individual child's needs exactly as they are. So some days I'm like, well, this, is, this isn't any different than anything else. I would do this for my other kid if he needed this. But then in other ways, you know, she needs a lot of extra attention, a lot of extra support. And so that does, that does present some challenges for us. But in general, she's just such a wonderful kid and she brings so much joy um, to our lives to our family's life we really appreciate the little things about her and we've just really again learned to parent the child that we have and not maybe the child we expected and I think maybe all parents get to that point at some point where they they realize oh I I can't control what this kid's going to do in their life and not do in their life I think maybe we just got to that point sooner. And so we just really got to the point where we're like, we have absolutely no control over how things are going to go. We're going to provide all the support and resources that we can. And then she's just going to turn in to the wonderful person that she is um, with our support. So she's doing great. She's in school. You know, she's got an IEP. She's, she's nonverbal. She uses a talker. It's been amazing to see the progress with that. I mean, the first time that she said mama on the talker, I mean, that was amazing. Yep. It was just as amazing as when my son said mama the first, you know, it was fun. You know, it just took a, it took a while longer for her and she did it a different way. But we still have, um, you know, all these different parenting joys. They're just a little bit different. So she's absolutely wonderful. Um, I'm so happy to be your mom. That's awesome. I... I think all of us one way or another have a, a, a parent recognition story the first time it was mama or dada and yet no, it doesn't matter whatever else happens. No one's taken that from us from from any parent. You know what I mean? Like that's your thing. That's really cool. So it's different for everybody. But 
we all have these parenting joys that we can celebrate. I agree. Amanda, before we let you go, what is the final thought you'd like to leave our audience with? Oh, goodness. Um, <laughs> Not to put you on the spot or anything. <laughs> well, you know, I, I always ask people, go tell five people about CMB today. Go, go tell five people. Go, go tell nice. those people who are young and childbearing age and they maybe aren't planning a baby yet, but maybe they're getting close and, and make sure that they know about this. That's, that's what I would say. That's awesome tell five people i'm i'm gonna do that i'm gonna remind oh. you know got a lot of medical friends but it, it doesn't matter if you do or you don't it's super duper common like you said you know and i would like to remind the audience that a lot of pregnancies so like nearly 50 percent of pregnancies are unplanned in the united exactly. states so even if you're not planning it doesn't mean it's not something you can think about and it is you know like you said rolling into that good hygiene stuff um change the you know the the placement of the little kissies you give your little angels and it it every little bit helps absolutely awesome well amanda i can't thank you enough your your insight the work that you're doing of course with the cmv foundation but really just coming here and talking with us and you know reminding us to to be aware, to raise that awareness, to tell five people and that everybody's journey is going to be a little bit different. So I am so grateful for what you're doing and for you. Um, thank you for being on the show and we hope to have you back in the future. So in the month of January, just keeping those CMV hashtags in mind, hashtag every journey matters and hashtag stop CMV. And that's going to do it for this episode of the Mother to Baby podcast. Be sure to hit that subscribe button so that way you never miss a new episode. And you can go back and listen or re-listen to some of those older episodes as well. You can find us on iTunes, Spotify, Audible, or however you like to listen to podcasts. And if you want to be on the podcast, or if you have an idea for the show, we would love to hear from you. Please feel free to email us at contact us at mother to baby.org. And mother to baby is here to answer your questions about exposures before and during pregnancy while breastfeeding, or if you have questions about exposures and adoption, you can reach us by phone at 866-626-6847 by text at 855-999-3525. You can visit us on our website, mothertobaby.org, and there you can chat with an information specialist. You can look at our many blogs, information pages, our hundreds of fact sheets that are available free in English and in Spanish. And you can also listen to our podcast, or find out how you can participate in our pregnancy studies. If you would like to support the Mother to Baby podcast, as well as all of the ways we get critical pregnancy and breastfeeding health information to you at home, we have a new way to do just that. In Circle is our new monthly giving society that helps ensure we can continue to provide our services at no cost. Join the community today and encircle parents and babies in health. Members will be recognized on the podcast and website. Visit mothertobaby.org slash donate today. Until next time, remember, Mother to Baby is here for you. Take care. Mother to Baby is a service of the nonprofit organization of Teratology Information Specialists and supported by the Health Resources and Service Administration of the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services. It's made possible through generous donations from listeners like you. To learn more about Mother to Baby, please visit mothertobaby.org.